Hey folks, this is The Other People Show. I'm Brad Listy in Los Angeles. Hope you're doing okay out there. It is Friday. It is time for a flashback episode. I'm going to dig into the archives today and share with you an outtake from episode 147 all the way back in 2013. My conversation with Joyce Johnson, author of The Voice is All, The Lonely Victory of Jack Kerouac. It was published on Viking Press. A reminder that if you want to listen to the full conversation with Joyce Johnson, all episodes of The Other People Show are in the feed. So go look for episode 147 if you want to hear the full talk with Joyce. A quick reminder before we get started that I do a weekly email newsletter. It is free. I would love it if you would sign up. You can do so at otherppl.com or bradlisty.com. Likewise, if you want to join the Other People Patreon community, you can do that at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. Help keep this show going into the future, get some merchandise, and so on and so forth over at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. Okay, so today's flashback features Joyce Johnson, author of several books, including the classic memoir, Minor Characters which chronicles her relationship with a young Jack Kerouac and her experiences as a woman coming of age in the Beat Generation. Minor Characters was voted one of the best memoirs of the past 50 years by the New York Times, and it received the National Book Critics Circle Award. Joyce Johnson's other books include Missing Men and Door Wide Open, a Beat Love Affair in Letters, 1957, to 1958. When I spoke with Joyce Johnson in episode 147, she was celebrating the publication of The Voice Is All, and she is one of the best resources on Jack Kerouac and the Beat Generation. And very fascinating to talk with a woman who lived among those men and moved around in those circles and was part of that very male movement. So good stuff. Let's get to it. This episode first aired on February 10th, 2013. Again, it is episode 147. Here I am in conversation with Joyce Johnson. It all happened back in the, back in the late 50s. Uh, I was going to Barnard College from 1951 to 55 and hanging out with a group of older people, people who were, you know, in graduate school or teaching. And these were people who had connections with the Beats because they'd been at Columbia at the same time as Allen Ginsberg and uh, and when Jack Kerouac was also around the campus. And uh, so I, I met Allen actually at a party when I was 16 years old. And at one party, even William Burroughs passed through on his way to uh, to Tangier. But I didn't meet Jack at that time. I met him in uh, January 1957, and it was a blind date set up by Allen Ginsberg, because uh, Allen always looked out for Jack, and Jack uh, was in New York, back from California, and penniless, and didn't have a place to live, and I was one of those rare young women who had her own apartment. So I, I was... Uh, I was very excited about meeting Jack because I had just read his first novel, The Town and the City. Uh, I was working for a literary agency at that time, MCA, and they had briefly been Jack's agents, and they were discarding a lot of books by former clients. So I took that book and went home to read it. And, and yeah, I, you know, it was it was very hard in those days for young women especially to leave home, uh, it was you know if you, if you did that, it was assumed you were a really bad girl, up to no good, and there were rifts with you know with 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 your family. So it was a hard time for me, and 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 the book, uh, that particular novel, captured for me a lot of the feelings I had about you know uh, striking out. For myself and cutting loose from my from my family, really, uh, you know, I felt it was really speaking to me in a very direct way, and it was gorgeously written. So, 
uh, I was very excited about meeting Jack, and he called me one, one night and asked if I would come down and meet him at a counter in Howard Johnson's and said he would be sitting at the counter wearing a red and black check shirt. So I walked in, and there he was, and I don't know, we really, we were both sort of shy people, but we really hit it off right away. So yeah, so tell me about these guys back then, you know, like Alan, Jack, first impressions, and then from there, you know, and then beyond, like, what were they, what were they like? And, and I don't know, try to give us a sense of who they really were, because we all have, you know, so many of us who've read these books uh, have a sense of who they are based on that. But, you know, what were they actually like in person? Uh, well, Alan, Alan was, uh, you know, I, a very exciting person, uh, you know, very intense and, you know, and, and filled with a real drive to change the world. You know, when that movie of Howl came out and Alan was played by James Franco, I thought they made a big mistake in, you know, in reading Howl in a kind of soft, elegi- elegiac way. We're really... At the time that Alan wrote it and first started giving readings of it, it was a polemic, an indictment, you know, against society, a desire to change things. And that spirit just seemed to be missing from the way that poem was interpreted. I thought that was a pity. And Jack, uh, Jack was quiet. Uh, you know, he, he, um, as I said, he he had he had he had this shyness about him. He was um, he was he was a very sort of conflicted person. I mean, he had an awareness all his life of duality, uh, which, as I found out when I started reading his journals, which accounts for what I experienced when I was with him. With these sort of constant sort of mood changes, attitude changes. You know. He could be loving, he could be distant, he could be unthinkingly cruel. You know, he, he was all those things. It, it was a constantly sort of shifting landscape. And, uh, and it was, was, well, it a, the, was it a shifting landscape in your observations of him, or was it, was it something that you, you really felt personally? Like, what was he like with you? Well, he was, like, he was that way with me. You know, he, he would, um, you know, his... his his moods and feelings kept, you know, kept fluctuating. We, we would, you know, we would, we would be very close, and then he would, you know, um, and then he would write. Well, well we, a lot of the time we wrote to each other because uh, he was doing a lot of moving around at the time I met him. He was with me for a couple of months, then he went off to Tangier, and then he planned to sort of stay in Europe for a while. And I wasn't sure he, I would ever see him again. And then he returned and in May, but just for a couple of days on his way to San Francisco, where he wanted me to beat him. So, but his plans kept changing, and, you know, he would would sound very eager for me to come, and then not so eager, that his plans were changing. It was, you know, it it was always hard to kind of figure out what was going on, and of course, of course, I was a kid. Uh, He he was, indeed, drinking very heavily. Um, He had had a an extremely hard time uh, during the uh, during the, during the early fifties when his work wasn't getting published, and he was, you know, going around the country, being kind of homeless and and living on nothing, and also, you know, exhausting himself in a way uh, by, you know, writing book after book in very short, concentrated periods of time. And I think he, you know, he fell into depression during those periods when he when he wasn't writing. He was, I think, he was he was better off psychologically. I think during the period when he we, when he was writing the town and the city, which he worked on for about four years, very steadily and in a very very disciplined way. His work was always sort of at the center of his life. Well, and I was going to say but, too, you know, when I when I read about Jack Kerouac, I mean, obviously there's a discipline that uh, factors into any successful writer's life. Uh, yeah, you can't yeah. Write, you can't write books without it. But he's notable for being like taking an almost athletic approach to the physical act of writing. The discipline is severe, and these bursts. It's very it's very severe discipline, and and even and and I and I and I and I suspect the you know. The, the discipline that that went 
into the whole act of what he called later called spontaneous writing was even more severe and taxing in its way. I bet it's sort of, you know, what it took him to get into those states of what he called transfixation, uh, you know, where he where he could do that kind of writing, the kind of writing he did Visions of Cody, for example. That that is that remains a mystery. There was nothing about what it took to get there. And then, um, you know, writing, you know, once he discovered that way of writing, writing became for him an ecstatic act. And and that was dangerous, I think. You know, he, I mean, sometimes writing is ecstatic and sometimes writing is as much fun as going down into the mines, you know, with a pick and a shovel. I mean, most <laughs> times it's that way. But he really, I, in in my view, began discovered a way to write a novel, as if it, almost as if he were writing a poem. You know, like seizing the moment of peak inspiration when you when you get this sort of rush of, rush of ideas and putting everything aside and and going with it and not getting up from your chair till it was done. It's a, it's a very tough way to go. Well, and, and what about? Because, like, I've read conflicting things. There's obviously, like, the Benzedrine use, and there's obviously, like, the legend of the scroll with On the Road, and yeah. you know, all these things have sort of been mythologized at this point. But They I've have all... been mythologized and mis- misunderstood, you know. So let's clear the record. Oh. Like, what, what, what actually went down when he sat down for one of these marathon writing sessions? And I've read that when he wrote On the Road, he was actually quite sober, and it was like a... He was, he was, and and uh, you know, and I, I think that was true at other times. I think he, I think he wrote uh, Doctor uh, Sachs, uh, you know, during the time he was taking a lot of marijuana. But I think, I think he, you know, he he claimed he didn't take anything but coffee when he was writing on the road, and I and I don't think he was, I don't think he, I think he was cold sober, uh, you know, while he was working on the town and the city, and then he would save all his drinking and living up for, you know, he would go into the city and meet with his friends and have an incredible binge and then return to his work in his mother's apartment. And were you were you uh, a party to some of these, these uh, you know, uh, binges? He, he, <laughs> Uh, well, he he wasn't he wasn't writing at the time that he was with me. I mean, I think he was he 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 was he was writing a bit in his journals and he was writing letters and he was very you know very taken up. Of course, once on the road came out with all that he you know all the demands that were made on him for sort of public appearances and interviews and so on in his. But he had he had written so much. Before the publication of On the Road, you know, all those books he wrote in between 1951 when he finished it and 1957 when On the Road actually came out, that, you know, he had begun to begun to worry secretly about whether or not he had sort of written himself out. I looked at a journal of his in, for, the fall, for the fall of 1957 recently, and in it, you know, he, he writes, you know, a sentence, you know, you know, can I write as well as I did in 1956? He was, you know, he was, uh, uh, he was worried about that. Well, you know, that's a good, I mean, and, and I think it's a valid concern because when you look at literary biography, you know, no matter who it is almost, and you look at yeah. most writers' lives, there usually is a very concentrated period of time when they do their best work. And it's, it's usually like 10 years, you know, it's usually, yeah, it seems to be true. that way. That's very, very true. few writers have that kind of longevity. You know, you think of like Saul Bellow. Yeah publishing in his late eighties and stuff like that. But most writers, it's a very short burst, really. Well, uh, you know, but, but for Jack, you know, even, even, even in night, even in 1962, when he was in tremendous trouble because of his alcoholism, he was still able to write a very brilliant book, uh, you know, Big Sur, just sort of an astonishing re- account of his psychological state. Which he wrote very quickly. Because wasn't that which book? He wrote, which he wrote, yeah, he wrote that very quickly. Yeah, like a yeah. matter a matter of days. I think so. Yeah, uh, but uh, what what I, I think people are gradually becoming aware that the, the, that three week writing stint that produced on the road in the spring of 1951 had been preceded by you know th- 
three years of, of relentless attempts to write that book, trying it this way, trying it that way, with different sets of characters, different plots. I mean, it went through all, you know, there were, there were just all these attempts. And, of course, he, he, he had originally had the idea for writing a, uh, that an On the Road in, in 1956, about a year before he met Neil Cassidy. The original idea, which is in his journal, was um, that he would like, he would like to write about... Uh, a man who, after recovering from a long illness, uh, decides to, you know, go hitchhiking across America to regenerate himself, and on the way uh, encounters a lot, a lot of symbolic characters. And this is before he met Neil. So for for a while, you know, that the idea of the protagonist making a journey was always sort of like a solitary journey that wasn't this companion. But there were. They, and, it's, it's interesting. Like some of the. I remember reading. Um, I forget who it was. Was it Harrington, who had an idea, or you know, there there were like there were kind of like premonitions of Neil before uh, Jack actually met him. Do you know what I'm that, saying? There were. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, he'd heard about him, but I don't. I don't know that he was too impressed by what he heard until he actually met him. In fact, he 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 says in Visions of Cody, I thought he would be an American saint who might turn out to be somewhat boring, you know, and... Or what about, oh, you know who it was? It was, that was, it was Bill Hubbard, the, the Texan that Kerouac yeah. met in the psych war. Oh, who, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, that figure, that, uh, that sort of wild figure who, who was a wanderer, this rootless person who was sort of a, you know, a, a kind of precursor of Neil. That's true. Right. So, um... Let's. I guess a, a natural question would be, since Jack Kerouac has obviously been written about um, by so many different people, and he, you know, there's a, there's quite a lot of uh, literature out there about his life and his work. Why this book, and why this particular approach to it? Well, I I felt there was there was a lot of important stuff about Jack that really really hadn't been covered. I had the desire to first of all to write a book that, that rather than, you know, focusing so much on the sensational episodes in his life. I mean, we've had plenty of books about those. I mean, that that I wanted to really closely follow, you know, his development into a writer and the way that he found his mature voice. I also had a had a very strong hunch that his Franco-American ethnicity was a huge factor in his life, and I wanted to understand it. I mean, everybody knew that Jack had, you know, came from a Franco Franco-American family, but oddly enough, no American writer had really gone into the implications of that. So once I, you know, once I began getting more of an understanding of. Uh, of, of the Franco-Americans, uh, you know, I had a, I, I, I began to see Jack sort of in new ways and, and then, understood how much he was a product of that background. And what did, yeah, what did that background bring to his, uh, his life and his work? You know, what, what would, what was it about all that? Like, can you describe it? Sure. Uh, well, you know, in, in, in this country, although we're very close neighbors of Quebec, we really know very little about the, 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 about that particular minority, the Franco Americans. They had they had started the, they had started leaving their sort of hard scrabble farms in Quebec in the 1880s and 1890s. They had enormous families, and their land was not producing enough food to feed them, and so they they came down to the the, the factory towns in New England in search of jobs. There was plenty of work there, and actually entire families could go to work, men, men women, and children. So uh, they came and settled into these different places in New England and in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, in Maine and Vermont. Uh, and in these, in these mill towns, they tended to live in, in rather insular communities. They were... They, unlike other groups, they really weren't looking to become assimilated. They they had a whole mystique about their culture and their language and their religion, which was a kind of form of Jansenist Catholicism. 
and they wanted to and, and they wanted to preserve it. So even people who, uh, you know, were born in America or, or 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 and grew up here, did not speak English well, and their children were ed- educated in uh, church schools that were, you know, half 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 the day was conducted in English, and the other half in French. Um, so they they really kept to themselves. At the same time, uh, this was reinforced by the fact that uh, New Englanders despised them, and there was tremendous prejudice against them. They were perceived as dumb and primitive people, and and there were horrible terms for them, such as the Chinese of America or white niggers. Remember that passage in On the Road where Jack is walking in Denver and thinks sort of bitterly about his white ambitions? Well, nobody nobody who really felt white would have coined that phrase. You know, he, he and so Jack coming out of that tradition, which he, he didn't want to lose. I mean he wanted to be he wanted to go out into America and become a writer and in order to do that he had to leave that community. In order to do that, he had to master English because there was no way he could he could write in that uh, Canadian French, which was a, a language of its own, um, with significant differences from classical French. Well, yeah, and I was I was also struck, you know, by how hard, well, a by how early he knew his path. I mean, he had a sense of this from a very young age, which a lot of writers do, and then yeah. also how. Um, how hard he worked to educate himself and how disciplined very he, hard from a young age i mean as a, as a, as a as a kid he tried to read all the books of the library he would go there every saturday and return home uh with just armloads of books and he called this his saturday avidities of reading at the at the age of i guess he was around 15 16 he discovered goethe who was immensely important important to him. Uh, one thing really changed uh, Jack's life because uh, the expectation had been that he would, you know, go through high school in, in those, um, those French parish schools, uh, but his family moved and there was no room for him in the, um, in the French junior high school, so he had to go into the American public school system. And there, uh, his ability to write was recognized by his English teacher, even though Jack, I I think, was quite silent in class because he wasn't yet fully fluent in English and and felt embarrassed by that. He he went. He had been registered in that school as he was in high school as a commercial student, you know, destined for a, you know, kind of a low-level clerical job at best. All right, folks, there we go. That is today's flashback from episode 147, my conversation with Joyce Johnson, author of the literary biography, The Voice is All, The Lonely Victory of Jack Kerouac. Episode 147 first aired on February 10th, 2013. A reminder that you can listen to the full conversation with Joyce Johnson It is in the feed. Look for episode 147. You can find Joyce on the internet at JoyceJohnsonBooks.net. She is also, I believe, on Facebook. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. Sign up for the Other People newsletter at OtherPPL.com or BradListy.com. And join the Other People Patreon community at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. If you want to do me a quick favor, go rate and review this show wherever you listen. It helps the show find new listeners. If you want to get some Other People apparel, a t-shirt, or a sweatshirt, you can do that at the show's official website, otherppl.com. Finally, a quick plug for my latest novel. It is called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. Available in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook, so check that out if you so desire. It's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. All right, so Sunday there will be an episode. It is still TBD. It's going to be a surprise. I think it's going to be a good surprise. It's a cliffhanger. Stay tuned.